Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and the breakdown for episode 5, Illyria, of the Halo TV series which aired today. And there's a lot to break down from this episode. I mean, there's been a lot to break down from most of the episodes so far, but this one is most definitely, it's not as action-packed, significantly less action, uh, but it kicks off right on the back of episode 4, the end of episode 4. Uh, but what's going on in the storyline, it's much more of a story-driven, character-driven kind of episode, but what's going on with the story, the things that are happening, the, so the, the seeds that are being sown throughout this episode, have immense implications for the long-term storytelling of the series, and is kicking into effect quite clearly now some aspects of the Halo universe that all of us are familiar with, and all of us are probably on board with, and I'm excited to see how that evolves over the coming episodes and, I would imagine, for some of these storylines, the next few seasons. We'll see. But in any case, normally I break down these things in sort of blocked pieces. Uh, in the last episode, because everything was relatively sequential, because most of the major storylines came together, we did almost the entire episode sequentially from scene to scene. This one we're going to do majoritively scene to scene again, because most of the major storylines are now intertwined. However, there are a couple of storylines now that are disparate, that have moved away from the core storyline, uh, but are likely to fold back into it in the next couple of episodes. So we'll tackle them grouped together. And there's a couple of scenes that switch back and forth very rapidly. Uh, I'll group those together as well just to make them a little bit easier to understand chronologically because talking back and forth and back and forth on those scenes I don't want to confuse anyone so in either case this is my breakdown and and weighing in on on my opinions on things and some theories this is the thoughts and theories series after all and uh, I'd love to get your feedback as the episode progresses so let's go for it As per usual, I've got notes written down, so I will be referring to those throughout the episode, so bear with. So we kick off immediately following the events of the previous episode. We literally, we're, in, we're still within the High Comm Tower, and we're still exploring the fight scenes that are going on there, and what's happened following Vanek's death. Uh, we get our first look at a Season 2 Brute that looks much more in keeping with the Halo 2 Anniversary Brutes, as opposed to uh, the stylization in, in Season 1 was... It's hard to say what exactly that stylization was, but it's very much more in keeping with the Halo 2 Brutes, particularly the Blur cutscene uh, Halo 2 Anniversary Brutes, and in some cases the Halo Reach and Halo 3 inspired Brutes, particularly armor-wise. Soren's humor is still present, again adding to my theory that I think Soren might step into the role of Sergeant Johnson in future series. Again, only time will tell. Uh, the Brutes are huge as well. It's it, it's difficult to get across how big they are when you're playing the games, but seeing it from this perspective, they're huge, but then so are the Elites. And mercifully, they're taken down by a ship immediately thereafter, which means that the Spartans don't have to attempt to do that out of armour. Brutes are strong enough to take down Spartans in their armour, so outside of their armour, it's, it's a really one-sided fight. I also like that, again, Soren's humour shines through because he claims responsibility for that kill, which is... Yeah, okay, I'll give him that. <laughs> Soren's wife and uh, and Quan arrive to actually recover the Spartans and Halsey, uh, which means that now all the major storylines have converged, which it, it doesn't stay that way, but it's it's nice to see. We'll also just quickly address uh, that Chief's the way Chief is responding to Vanek's death. The writing very clearly follows the widely accepted stages of grief. There are five stages of grief, uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. It's also worth noting that these stages are not m all mutually exclusive uh, and, and like clearly separated and differentiated from each other. You can be experiencing any more than one of them at any given time, and the change between them is not a sudden threshold. In this immediate scene, it's so soon after Vanek's loss that we're still kind of in the shock phase before even the stages of grief have, have kind of kicked in. Uh, but throughout the episode, Chief goes through all five stages. Riz makes a choice to go back and recover Vanek's body. This speaks to a couple of things, actually. Now, veterans will confirm the sheer idea of leaving one of their fallen brothers or sisters behind is absolutely unacceptable. Two, it is known that some Covenant species, namely grunts, brutes, and jackals, will eat humans if given the opportunity. 
and the idea of, of allowing Vanek's body to be desecrated like that I don't think the Spartans could stomach that, or particularly in this case, Riz could stomach that. And finally, even though they're not wearing their armor, leaving a Spartan in the field may represent uh, a potential security breach. Although this normally applies to when they're actually wearing their armor as well, and obviously the armor's got so much technology and innovations built into it that they didn't want it falling into enemy hands, uh, they had instructions to activate their fusion pack into the self-destruct mode to destroy the armor and the occupant inside. And Spartans are so synonymous with their armor uh, that this might be kind of a standing order that may be difficult dif to differentiate or separate between just the equipment and the Spartan. The Spartan could even be viewed upon as being equipment themselves, loosely speaking. Riz actually manages to get Vanek back to the ship but is severely injured in the process. This may quite possibly be the final straw for Riz. Uh, she's already been struggling to keep up to the uh, and maintain the same level as the other Spartans like from a physical output standpoint. This may be kind of the final excuse that she needed to actually step out of service altogether. Likely aided in no small part by the rapport that she developed with Lewis and the advice that she sought from Lewis in regards to kind of le leading a normal life, or as Lewis would put it, being a nobody. Chief here actually demands that Riz gets the medical attention first, which I'd argue should have happened due to uh, how battlefield medicine and triage works. Riz is evidently more in need as her injuries appear to be more severe, but in practice, he's the Master Chief, and his strategic value here probably outweighs triage. We finally get some flashbacks here as well of Chief uh, following Cortana's removal from his skull, and uh, you can hear quite clearly he's flatlined. He's dead, just as he was at the end of Season 1. That's when Parangoski appears and barters with Cortana to save him. This again solidifies that Parangoski in this episode, in fact in this season as a whole, is the Sink Oni that we know from the books. The dark, deceitful, playing all the angles, working from the shadows, influencing things from behind the scenes Sink Oni. She's stepped into this role in this season perfectly. And this bartering for Chief's life from Cortana trying to save him and, and evidently having to do something for Parangoski in order to kind of buy that barter, so to speak, to buy that that revival of the chief, plays into some significant changes, narratively speaking, later in the episode that also will play out over the next, the rest of the season and the next couple of seasons, I would imagine. Again, we'll touch on that shortly. Also, it's somewhat of a given that the level of medical science that's available in the Halo universe, particularly by the UNSC in the 26th century, is significantly more advanced than we have in the modern era, and thus they are actually able to revive people who have, who have been clinically dead for a while, given the right circumstances are in place. We know that from the law. Linda was just one such a, a Spartan where she had completely flatlined and was flatlined for a while uh, before Chief managed to get her into a cryopod. She remained in that cryopod for few weeks as I recall until she was finally revived uh, on reach by Halsey and, and given like cloned organ transplants and, and surgeries to get her fighting fit again. Following the open credits we actually get a view of reach from orbit being glassed and it's horrifically glorious. We can even see the glassing beams from ships that seem to be occluded in some cloud cover just bombarding the surface. It's a beautiful if kind of grotesquely beautiful scene. This view is actually from aboard a, a Covenant ship, and McKee sheds a tear. Now, I'm, I'm unsure if she's shedding a tear for the fact that she's seen Chief, or if she's shedding a tear because it's the fall of Reach, and actually Reach was probably the first planet she went to that was a human colony that she actually saw some degree of uh, of, of pleasant of pleasant beauty. Obviously, the, the colony that she was raised on was kind of a, a, a like a junkyard colony, almost, and, um, and they were subjugated and, and abused and so Reach was the first planet she saw that was actually pleasant to a degree. Again, there's still no real explanation as to how or why she's alive in this season, so for now I guess we'll brush over that. The dialogue between McKee and the Arbiter gives a little more detail on their motivations. Uh, the facial animation on the Arbiter is extremely good, very expressive, and they bear a facial resemblance and stature much more in keeping with Halo 2 Sangheili. He's appropriately no nonsense just as all Sangheili should be, and demonstrates a quite obvious dislike or disdain or even disgust of McKee as a human, as Sangheili at this stage of the war should. We cut away to Chief waking up, severely injured and wanting to check on Riz. 
Riz evidently needs further surgeries to recover. Chief here says about the fact that she shouldn't have gone back to get Vanek. Um, and that she knows better. Well, there are plenty of examples in the lore of Spartans leaving fallen Spartans behind. Uh, there are just as many examples of Spartan... There are just as many examples of Spartans doing everything they can to protect a fallen Spartan from Covenant forces. As I said before, this usually includes igniting their armor's fusion fell safe. But in this example, I believe this speaks more so to the fact that the Spartans are finally fully understanding that they are human, they have emotions that they're more than just machines, more than just military hardware or weapons. Riz, as we've seen through this season so far, is on something of a storyline to realise a more simple non-militaristic life. Again, a fair few active duty Spartans have dropped out of service for a simpler civilian life. So it's not immediately unusual for that to take place. Uh, and I think, again, Riz is a little further around the curve than the others in her emotional development. And thus, the motivation by her emotional connection to Vanek to recover his body, even to her own detriment or risk, is probably the motivating factor behind this decision to go and get him. Chief blames himself because the training mission that we had a couple of episodes back where he's wanting to push Riz uh, in spite of her injuries to try to get her back up to the level of the other Spartans, when in reality that just wasn't going to happen. This may seem to Chief like that's the reason he feels that she had something to prove almost, but I think it's really that Riz was emotionally motivated to recover Vanek, that's it. Chief at this point is in the denial part of grief. Uh, he's somewhat denying that Vanek is even dead because he has dehumanized the body, uh, claiming that there was no Spartan left behind uh, because he was already gone. We come back to the themes of choice in this moment as well, referencing the lack of choice that the Spartans had in their conscription, their training, their augmentations, even the regulator chips that regulated sort of their, their emotional and hormonal levels to, to keep them unfeeling, emotionless machines, basically, and just blindly following orders. This is the kind of seminal moment that the Chief is finally confronting the traumas of having his life choices stolen from him and finally addressing the issue with the woman he views as being the perpetrator of these traumas against him. It goes without saying that while this is a painful process, it is also necessary to come to terms with it and move on. Chief's denial is overlapping to the second stage, anger, in the following scene. The anger stage often requires something of a target, uh, someone to blame or to direct their anger towards. Halsey, both rightly in some cases, but also wrongly, is the target, but it shifts very, very rapidly. He moves much more clearly into the anger stage when he references the Office of Naval Intelligence and Ackerson as he clearly thinks that they are to blame for the losses he suffered most immediately, the things that caused these stages of grief to come to the surface, the loss of Vanek, Riz being in the condition that she is, the absence of Kai. He views that since Oni and Ackerson, they, they left them on reach with no evac, no armor, they basically just left them there to die and they knew that it was coming as well. This is yet another significant step, a big step towards the only enemy storyline that so many of us loved during kind of the advertisement campaign for Halo 5. This is laying the groundwork for a lasting storyline that will hopefully carry the season uh, or the series as a, as a whole long into the future. I say this because obviously the more immediate threat is the Covenant in this circumstance. The, the Covenant are at humanity's doorstep. At this point in the universe, that's the primary focus. We're in the closing days of the war where either humanity's fate will be sealed and they will be ex uh, they'll be extinguished by the Covenant or will rise and, and manage to defeat the Covenant. That's what's going on. That's at the forefront. That's the most immediate threat. So that has to be addressed first. However, but once this is done, only are next on the agenda and Chief won't easily forget this. I'd even go so far as to suggest that Vanek's death here is actually affecting Chief to a similar level to Sam's death in the original lore, Sam being the very first Spartan that died in active combat, but that's a tentative connection to make it best. In either case, Oni being the enemy, I'm very excited about where that narrative might go long term. I'll also quickly note here that at the time Oni were evacuating Reach ahead of the attack, none of Silver Team were wearing their armour. They had been removed from active duty because of what because of going rogue so to speak and, and going to the visegrad relay uh in spite of of being told not to and, and being told that cobalt team were elsewhere regardless of the fact that it was a lie it was all a manipulation 
they had still been punished for it. And they were still off duty. Not act They were not serving active duty and they were out of their armor. So when Oni evacuated and took all the vital assets, they took vital assets that were both personnel and equipment off-world. Mjolnir is an extremely expensive and valuable asset. And since they weren't wearing the suits, they were removed. Had they been wearing it, that wouldn't have been possible. But ultimately, the long-term game plan of Oni was to have Silver Team unarmored, on reach, during the fall to guarantee their deaths. The only survivor, in their hopes at least, being the only Spartan, interestingly enough, willing to aid them. Kai. And the reason they left Cortana is because they know how she was created and thus disposing of her would have also worked to their advantage. However, I think it goes a bit deeper than that. And we'll, we'll touch on that shortly. It has something to do with Parangoski. We'll, we'll touch on it shortly. We begin a very gentle shift over into the bargaining stage uh, where Chief is realizing he was sedated and put into a medically induced coma for a couple of days. That means that while he was unconscious, two days of battle was raging on the surface of Reach. And of course, he hasn't seen the condition of Reach. The battle started and really it was just like the primary, the, the main city being attacked as far as they could tell. Over those two days, that battle would have expanded dramatically. So Chief realizing this feels like he needs to bargain with Halsey to get them to turn around and go back so that he can get onto Reach and help the survivors, help people that are there. But it becomes obvious that by this point the losses are already near absolute and you can see the grief on Chief's face. You can see that, it, that he doesn't take that well. Again the characterization that Pablo is man managing to articulate here of Chief, I'm having these odd moments where I'm, I'm watching him react but I feel like I'm watching the Master Chief but his armor's transparent. I said this in the last episode, there are these moments where, where Pablo is nailing certain body gestures certain the, certain the way he reacts the way he moves his head the way he turns it away you know from from the source of the bad news uh is is very in keeping with the characteristics of chief chief does that at the end of halo 4 when cortana is telling him you know we we were supposed to save each other we were supposed to supposed to help each other you know she was she was on our way out she was dying and he couldn't confront that so you know he would turn his head away he wouldn't wouldn't look at her Pablo is doing exactly that here, and and like I say, just just as I got in the in the previous episode, in this in this episode, I'm getting these these almost bizarre moments, these these strange moments where I feel like I'm watching the chief in his armor, but I can see through his armor. So I can only assume, as I said in the previous episode, that that is happening because Pablo's uh, Pablo's almost channeling of the chief's inner personality is so good that it's kind of a borderline uncanny valley, so to speak. We see a little bit of Halsey's motherly side come out here. Now, again, season one, Halsey, very black and white, very war criminal, very narcissistic sociopath. No two ways about it. I made that abundantly clear with my coverage of season one and in the early stages of season two. But there's a significant shift going on through the entirety of this, of this season so far where Halsey is shifting dramatically from being the black and white war criminal narcissistic sociopath to the morally grey Halsey that we know, that we know so familiar from the books. And again, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying seeing that, this transformation, seeing that she's not all black and white. There is these subtleties to her character, these nuances. Uh, it's it's lovely to see, and it, it's it's positively reinforced as well. Where she references the we moment, you know, and and Chief even as he's being sedated and, go, and going under says, "Oh, so it's we now," and she replies, "It's always been we. It always has been." That's again, it plays into that. It, although things have been perceived and presented, perhaps that Halsey has been this black and white character, so, so to speak, all this time. There's more to it than we're seeing, as we saw in the previous episode, where where she arranged. For there not to be any guards, so Soren could escape when he was younger. Why would she do that if she didn't have a, a somewhat motherly instinct towards them? It's it's interesting. It's very interesting. Back with McKee, and we finally get hints about the motivations for this season. The Hierarchs were going to kill McKee at the end of season one. We know that. Uh, M Mercy was talking to the other prophets and saying quite clearly that once the McKee has shown them the location of the Halo through the the, the two artifacts, she's outlived her usage, kill her, there's no place for her on the great journey. Still just manipulating and using humans 
to their own ends, just as profits should and do. But of course, in this season so far, we also have to bear in mind that they don't have either one of the artifacts, they, and they also don't know the location of the Halo because it was deactivated before they had the opportunity to actually see the map in its entirety. So her being alive in this season is likely motivated by the fact that the map was incomplete uh, and humanity now possess both artifacts, although obviously they've taken one back, the larger of the two. But um, the smaller one was extracted with off the Office of Naval Intelligence when they left Reach before the attack. So they've only got one of the artifacts, which means they can't form the map. So McKee was likely revived to recover these artifacts, activate them and, and show the way then she would have outlived her purpose again. Again, this manipulation of the profits and using humanity uh, as and when they need them uh, is is bang on character, just as they did with just as they did with uh, with Halo Wards and Anders, uh, Halo 2 with Miranda, Halo 3 with Johnson, uh, and even Halo Infinite with... Um, I can't remember the name of the scientist. But there was a scientist who was used to unlock the Silex that released the Harbinger. Very on-brand for members of the Covenant to know humans as having that status of reclaimers and their innate capabilities of activating foreign artifacts and using them to their own ends. It's, it's good. Back with Chief and another three days have elapsed. Spartans healed significantly faster than normal humans so while three days before he was almost barely capable of walking now he's up and about limping and in discomfort but much better than a normal human would be in this situation. Quan takes Chief to see Vanek's body. Chief touches into depression for a moment. Uh, but regresses very quickly back to denial in this scene, uh, refusing to look at him and again dehumanising the body. The term, that's a body, my friend isn't here, uh, was a line I really felt. For those who haven't lost somebody whom you care about, uh, this might not quite have the same impact, uh, but from experience, uh, when I lost my mother, after they had announced that she'd gone, we gathered around and, and said our goodbyes. Uh, and then there was this moment in the room where one moment she was my mum and then the next it was it was like what made her her had gone it had left and what was what was left behind was the shell like almost the 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 object or suit that she used to interact with a kind of a physical world but the person I loved had left it was and is an odd moment uh, to experience but I appreciate the attention to detail that the writers put in to putting that into this episode and it's one of those it's one of those situations that you, you can't kind of fake uh, you know that through experience moving on from that Soren lets Chief know that they're inbound on the colony of Illyria uh, and that his son Kessler is there when they arrive on Illyria Riz immediately goes into surgery and in true fashion Halsey takes full control of the surgery as she rightly would uh, Soren and Liera immediately set after gaining some information on Kessler's whereabouts and then set out to find him. We'll circle back to this. Riz wakes up following surgery and it becomes obvious that she'll never operate at Spartan levels again. Um, this is the tip that was needed for Riz to give her the chance to leave the military. Just quickly sticking with Riz and jumping forward in the episode, the next scene that we get with her is her waving to a native on the planet uh, and then jump forward again her talking to Chief and confirming that she is stepping out of action. She's stepping out of the line of duty to lead a normal life. After saying goodbye to the Chief, uh, she rejoins the natives, concluding what we all knew would happen, and that was that Silver Team had to be disbanded. They had to go their separate ways. Vanek has died. Riz is going to be living a normal life, and Kai, well, we'll, we'll get to her shortly. Also, a really quick note here, Referencing back to Halsey becoming that morally grey character, that mother motherly character. Halsey says to Riz about being no one now, and Riz actually <laughs> smiles to that and walks off, because it likely harkens back to her earlier conversations with Lewis. And note that after Riz leaves and actually rejoins the natives, Halsey steps up and retrieves her dog tags. In doing so, she has basically just protected Riz from anyone coming back for her because she can now take those dog tags back to command and use them to confirm that Riz is KIA or more accurately MIA leaving Riz to peacefully live her life again this morally grey Halsey emerges just a quick note here Quan saying about you know a, a planet of people dying is too big of a problem for a person's brain to wrap around 
Sounds a little familiar. Anyway, we'll circle back to the funeral and cover it shortly. Uh, for now, we'll follow Soren and Liera um, looking for Kessler. After a little tension building back and forth between the, his apparent captors, so to speak, or adopted parents, I, I, I don't really know what quite what to make of this, uh, Liera finds what she thinks is Kessler, but it's revealed that it isn't, and that Kessler actually had given his helmet to another child because Kessler could see that this child was scared, meaning Kessler is still out there somewhere. Soren and Liera eventually return to the camp, and the person who gave them that lead, that bit of information, um, is confronted. Liera insists Soren waits outside, and using her mother's fury, uh, goes full Negan, and gets herself a bat wrapped in barbed wire, and uh, intimidates the guy into giving up accurate information. We don't actually know if she ended up using the bat, and, you know, doing a whole, a whole Glen scenario, but, uh, what we do know is that the UNSC took Kessler. Now that I found interesting. In the previous episode, Halsey demonstrated a keen interest in Kessler in the fact that he was the child of a Spartan II. She was curious if he had inherited Soren's genetics, first and foremost, because Spartan II's have better genetics than most human beings anyway, but also was interested to see if some of the augmentations had passed down. Now, the children of Spartans are informally referred to as Spartan 2.1s. It is not a coincidence that Halsey shows interest in Kessler and then he disappears at the hands of the UNSC shortly thereafter. Now, I'm not saying it was directly Halsey who was involved in this, as Oni also have the reach and the resources to find out this information for themselves, but I do wonder if the plan is to either turn Kessler into like a Spartan, like an, a formal Spartan 2.1, or maybe turn him into a Spartan 3, or maybe because of his age, he becomes a Spartan 4, or at least some experimentation on him in some capacity. I'm not sure. But this would serve to make Oni an enemy of Soren and Liera, as well as Chief. So at this stage, we can say with confidence that Chief is after Oni uh, for what they did to him and Silver Team on Reach leaving them to die. Soren and Liera are, will hate Oni for taking Kessler. Quan will hate Oni for putting out a hit on her in Season 1. And Halsey will hate Oni for setting her up, capturing her and Soren, uh, and taking Cortana. as Probably as well as blaming them for the death of, of Admiral Keyes as well. So Oni is basically making an enemy of everyone, and that's exactly what is needed uh, if they are to become a primary, like, villainous entity in the future. I think that we can all agree that we are on track to a hunt the truth scenario, uh, and I'm here for it. We wanted it back with Halo 5, and the, the TV series is delivering it. So now back with Vanek's funeral, uh, we're seeing a few scenes spliced together with the scenes of Soren and, and Liera looking for Kessler. In these scenes, uh, focusing on Vanek's funeral, however, Chief is showing he's settled into the depression stages of grief. Uh, and by the time he makes it to Quan and tells the gathered people, put him in the sky, burn him, uh, he's begun to move into the acceptance stage. Uh, and by the time the funeral pyre is done, Chief is fully in acceptance. Uh, he gives a few words to honour Vanek, alluding to the adage, Spartans never die, uh, while promising to go after Oni, and also having a little dig at Halsey uh, for the origins of the Spartan program, and finally lights the pyre, giving Vanek his final send-off. Halsey follows Chief here and actually reminds him that whilst going after Oni is dangerous, the more immediate threat is the Covenant, and the only way to guarantee humanity's survival of the Covenant is to find the Halos. She also then reveals that she didn't really choose John, so to speak, but it's something inside of Chief, alluding to his gene song, that was the reason he was chosen for the Spartan program. Something I believe to actually somewhat be a half-truth, but we'll let that go for now. Ultimately, Chief is now gripped by vengeance, uh, and he isn't really seeing his higher calling at this stage, but in the next couple of episodes, he will. We next get a peculiar vision type sequence with Quan, likely hearkening back to her episode in season one where she was shown her gene song by the, the witches or mystics in the desert. I'm not exactly sure what they were again. Uh, why this vision takes the form of the religious leader from Sanctuary uh, is anybody's guess. I don't know. Uh, but the message is clear. She is deviating from the path that she's meant to follow and she's kind of being urged back onto course kind of as per her gene song. 
We'll see how this plays out in the long game, I'm sure. We return to McKee and the Arbiter as they approach High Charity having been recalled. Knowing full well that their return without having one killed the demon uh, and two having both artifacts in tow will mean they both die. McKee attempts to convince the Arbiter to abandon his post. Now the Arbiter is already a fallen elite who has been made Arbiter as a punishment with the expectation that he will give his life to die with honour. Still highly zealous, McKee blasphemes, uh, which pushes him to anger, and he nearly strikes her until a projection of the halo appears. She uses this to convince the Arbiter that he has kind of a, a divine uh, destiny almost to achieve, and that the prophets are false, and he need really only reach out and take the power that's rested at his feet. The projection itself is actually coming from Cortana, and the ruse actually works at convincing the Arbiter to abandon his post, uh, and McKee and the Arbiter are now in cohorts to subvert the Prophets, which leads me to believe that this Arbiter may end up being something approximating Caesar Refumi, or as many of us gamers of the Halo franchise will know, as the Heretic Leader. With this we get the beginning of the Heretics, and Cortana is likely simply doing what she can to survive and gather intelligence on their enemy. However, referencing back to Parangoski, I believe it's entirely possible uh, that the very reason that she was left on reach was for exactly this purpose. Parangoski promising to save Chief's life may have been done so on the promise that Cortana would help Oni destabilize the Covenant from inside, and what better way to do that than to create a heretical fracture, so to speak, a heretical splinter of the Covenant. At this point it isn't clear, but the pieces are moving, although I'm still confused as to how McKee survived, it seems to at least now be serving a deeper purpose uh, that may play into a much longer term narrative. And again, I'm actually getting excited for it. And finally, Kai. We find her on Onyx, with Ackerson, just as I and many of you expected. She is now leading the Spartan 3s and we get a entire company of Spartan 3s come to attention to her presence. And that's where we're left. So my overall thoughts, my final thoughts on the episode, it's much less combat, much less... So my overall thoughts and opinions on the episode as a whole, much less combat, much less action, but the story elements that are being developed and driven in this episode are extremely important and very significant to both the short-term and long-term progress of the series. Now, we've got... Obviously the Spartan 3 is being brought into the fold and Kai kind of serving something of the role of Kurt in uh, in the Ghost of Onyx. We've got Oni making enemies of everyone, including Sorin, uh, including Chief, including Halsey, including ev everyone. Which means that we've got the Hunt the Truth thing on the on the horizon potentially. We've got Sorin, I think quite possibly still on track to becoming uh, kind of a Sergeant Johnson-esque character. We've got Kessler perhaps becoming a Spartan 2.1. We've got McKee and the Arbiter splitting off from High Charity and, and from the Covenant at, at large to almost become something of the heretics, so to speak, that subvert the Prophets and, and see the Prophets as being false. And we get Silver Team finally kind of fracturing and going their disparate ways. Obviously, Vanek's dead. Riz is now taking a civilian life. Kai leading the, the Spartan 3s, and that leaves Chief to go forward alone as we know he kind of has to for the events of, of Halo CE. All in all, the storylines that are being developed and that have really kind of been expressed in this in this episode really highlight the manipulations of the Office of Naval Intelligence, really highlight some of the internal conflicts that are happening with the Covenant before we're, before we're even fully aware of them in the games, and again are pushing this narrative of just how desperate the war was at this stage. Now, Another episode of the Spartans not in their armour I know will be a little bit of a gripe for some people, but in the next couple of episodes, I think we can pretty much guarantee the Spartans are going to get their suits back. At the end of the day, Chief has to go and recover Cortana at some point. That has to happen soon, and I think now that the Arbiter and McKee have moved away from High Charity and moved away from the Covenant, they'll end up somewhere on their own, presenting the opportunity for Chief and perhaps some other Spartans to go and get Cortana. And while I'm on the subject, I remember, as I'm sure you remember, some very brief scenes from the teasers and trailers showing Spartans wearing their armour with the Anubis thrusters diving towards a Covenant ship. Now, I can only assume that Covenant ship is the Covenant ship that has McKee and the Arbiter on board. 
Who are the Spartans? One of them's going to be Chief. Who are the others? Because it's obviously not going to be Vanek. Vanek's dead. It's obviously not going to be Riz. She's taken a civilian life. It's likely not to be Kai. She's leading the Spartan Threes. Who are they? Are we perhaps seeing the beginnings of Blue Team? It's a theory. I'm just throwing it out there. All, to, all in all, fantastic episode. Much less action, much less combat, but the narrative, huge developments and huge implications if it is carried through, particularly for the, like the long term, for the hunt the truth, and for the short term, for the rest of this season, as well as like those those deep threads of narrative for the heretics down the line. It's paving the way. I'd love to hear your thoughts, particularly on who the hell those other Spartans are in the scene that we saw in the trailer. And particularly on your thoughts of the heretic. The heretic elites. Perhaps this arbiter is the heretic leader. I'd love to know your thoughts. In any case, thanks for watching. And until next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider smashing the like button and leave a comment below on what you'd like me to cover next. Big shout out to my patrons, Spartan10148, the Metarch of my installation. Falcon, Prophet Bear, Mikhail, Sophia, and Ashley, my dutiful monitors. Darian, Scarab, Spartan0137, Anthony, Ghost, Aaron, Chris, Jacob, Sean, Element0, Somatic, Jordan, J3, Dan, Mr. Keys, Directal, Gunslinger, Jacob, Bandmill, Echo, Evermore, Officer Cat, and Personal Devil, my diligent submonitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, and my loyal enforcers. And all the other patrons who have jumped aboard to support the channel, it means more to me than I can accurately put into words. Another shout out to my Tier 0 Transcendent YouTube members, Spartan137, Jacob, Schmitty, Talia, Fenrir and Born Stella. And all the other YouTube members keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Shout out to John for, I don't fucking know. And if you want more of this kind of content, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. And consider jumping aboard yourself as a patron or YouTube member to keep the channel alive and kicking. Thanks again for watching. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain.